Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, may they be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. So the other day, Megan and I were shopping in a clock store and uh, found a grandfather clock that we really, really enjoyed. And even better, it was marked 25% off. So I paid for it and had it delivered the next day. And when it was delivered, we set it up in a prominent spot in the living room. And much to my chagrin, I discovered that this clock ran slow. No matter how I adjusted this clock, the clock lost 15 minutes every single hour. So returning to the clock store, I complained to the manager and I said, this grandfather clock loses 15 minutes every single hour. The manager replies, he goes, well, what did you expect? It was clearly marked 25% off. <laughs> Well, what did you expect? How many times have we heard that question offered to us? Well, what did you expect? That's a loaded question right now. What do we expect in the next two weeks? What do we expect for the next four years? What are our expectations? What better place than with the community of faith to remind ourselves that no matter what, no matter what happens, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is our King. And we live in Christ's kingdom. The United Methodists for a long time had a liturgical season in the autumn known as Kingdom Tide. We are in Kingdom tide. When we are reminded of that knowledge that Christ is King, when we find ourselves in that, we find ourselves united, we find ourselves at peace with one another. We should be reminded of the words of St. Augustine in essentials, unity, in non essentials, liberty, in all things charity. And our essential is clearly this. Jesus Christ is Lord and King. Jesus Christ is our Messiah. And it's this concept of Messiah, this concept of expectation that leads us to our texts this morning. See, if we were transported back to Jesus' time, say that we were first century Jews waiting for the Messiah, there were many different expectations as to who this Messiah was going to be. See, I think we've done ourselves some great disservice as the church when we just simplify things or we, we kind of make it into this idea that Jesus Christ obviously fulfilled everyone's expectations. But if that were true, then we wouldn't have gospel writers testifying to the fact that Jesus Christ does fulfill those expectations. We wouldn't have the letter to the Hebrews proving over and over again how Jesus fulfills the expectations of Messiah. See, some believed that the Messiah would come from the priestly line. This line of thinking saw the Messiah as calling the people of Israel back into right worship practices. And with a critical mass of people doing right worship practices, this would usher in the kingdom of God once and for all, liberating Israel restoring the relationship between God and humanity. So obviously those that thought this way would be expecting the Messiah to come from the priestly tribe, the tribe of Levi. And, and the Messiah would live up to their expectations. He would look and act 
and would be on their side, they would see him coming a mile away. They would, they would see him. They were expecting what they wanted to expect. So round peg, round hole, and to their undiscerning eye, in their blindness, Jesus was a square peg. Now, some others believed that Jesus would come from the line of prophets, that Jesus, or this Messiah, would call the people of Israel back into right living, would call them into right Torah practices, and then establish a new covenant, a critical mass of right practice, and that this prophet, like Moses, like Elijah, would be credible and lend credence to his authority by performing signs and wonders, healing. And in the midst of them seeing this, God would restore the kingdom of Israel. God would be present with God's people. And so those expecting a prophet, a teaching Messiah, were expecting to see and to hear. And it would be clear through these signs and wonders that would match with calling back to Torah, or at least what they expected in terms of right teaching of Torah. The Messiah would live up to their expectations. And they would see him. They would see him a mile away. They were expecting what they wanted to expect. Round peg, round hole, undiscerning eye, blindness. Jesus was a square peg. And then there were those who expected the Messiah to come from the line of kings. The royal Davidic line, this line of thinking was that the Messiah would lead the people of Israel militarily back into a royal, independent, liberated kingdom. And this kingdom would be the everlasting kingdom and the government shall be upon his shoulders. So obviously those that thought this way would be expecting the Messiah to come from the tribe of Judah, same as David. And the royal Messiah would live up to their expectations. The king of kings, he would pick up a sword. Their expectations, round peck, round hole. And when Jesus chose not to lift a sword, he was the square peg. It's safe to say that Jesus, as Messiah, did not live up to any of their expectations did not come from the tribe of priests. While he did heal and perform signs and wonders, he didn't look the part. He didn't say the words that the religious authorities were wanting him to say. He just didn't fit in. He wasn't sophisticated. In fact, he was a ragamuffin peasant from a podunk town. I think we forget that sometimes in the midst of our order our high pulpits, our pomp and circumstance. And while Jesus did come from the tribe of Judah, he was a direct descendant of David, but he never raised the sword. He didn't fit the part. He wasn't violent. He was peaceful, and he dashed the hopes of those around him who expected a resurgence of the politics of God and freedom from Rome. And this is where the story gets good. See, for those who expected a priest, Jesus didn't look like what they wanted to see. For those who expected a prophet, he didn't say what they expected him to say. And for those who expected a king, he didn't act like what they wanted in a king. But for those with eyes to see. And that brings us to a blind man named Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus saw him a mile away on the Jericho road on the side as Jesus and his disciples are leaving Jericho and they're on their way up to Jerusalem for this last time to celebrate Passover to offer sacrifice, to offer the sacrifice. Jesus 
is on his way. By the way, did you know that the word sacrifice, sometimes I think we have a little bit of an issue with the word sacrifice, especially when somebody else tells us that that's what we ought to do, right? Sacrifice, well, you need to make sacrifices. Or even when we think of Old Testament practices of sacrifice, we think it's outdated. We think that we've moved beyond this idea of sacrifice. But let's look at the Latin words that are the root of that word sacrifice. Sacrum fatere, to make sacred. That's what sacrifice is about, to make sacred. Sacrifices are offered as a symbol of restored relationships, relationships that have been made whole, made holy. And so Bartimaeus is on this roadside, Jericho, Jesus on his way up to Jerusalem, and Bartimaeus cries out, Son of David! That's a messianic statement in just three words. Recognizes Jesus fulfilling the role of Messiah as King, Son of David. And Jesus says to Bartimaeus, what is it that I can do for you? And this is where Jesus is completely unlike myself. See, in that situation, I would have automatically assumed that Bartimaeus wants to be healed, wants his eyesight back. So I'd probably rush in and try to heal. But Jesus is not assuming anything. In fact, it's almost as if Jesus is question about that says Bartimaeus I think you may be the only one around here that's seeing it the way that it needs to be seen why is there any healing that needs to happen if you already see it for what it is but he asks Bartimaeus, what is it that you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus replies, he says, my teacher, again, another messianic address, recognized him as king, now recognizes him as teacher, prophet, healer. Teacher, I want my sight again. Jesus responds, your belief has made you well. I think it's safe to rephrase this. Your belief, Bartimaeus, your open expectations of Messiah, Bartimaeus, has made you well. Bartimaeus calls him king, calls him prophet, and how this episode ends should not be lost on us. Bartimaeus begins to follow Jesus on the way is what it says. And where is Jesus going? Jerusalem. Why is he going to Jerusalem? To celebrate Passover, to offer the sacrifice. See, Bartimaeus saw Jesus not just as prophet, not just as king, but is now seeing him as priest. He saw that Jesus was going to do something significant enough that he followed Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. So you may be saying this morning, Big deal. It's very good information, Phil, if this was a Bible study. For a Bible geek like yourself, this is great information, but how is this boiling down for me in my life? I think it boils down to this. What are our expectations of Jesus And here's where I put forward the notion that I don't think that we have fixed and high expectations of Jesus Christ as Messiah anymore. I don't think that's our problem. I think our problem is, is that we have very low expectations, maybe no expectations at all 
of Jesus Christ as our Messiah anymore? Have we displaced our messianic expectations? Freedom, liberty, justice. Have we traded all of those things in for trust in an American government by our pick of president? Think about this. Our anxiety about the election, and maybe even some of us who are anxiously apathetic about the election, all of that anxiety betrays our lack of trust in Jesus Christ as king, priest, and prophet. No matter who's president, Jesus is king. And why should Jesus be our king? Because he's our prophet. Because he's our priest. Because he's our king. As Paul so eloquently states in Philippians chapter 2, why should Jesus be our king? And Paul puts it out there in the framework. In Philippians 2, he's calling this fledgling community of Philippi to be of the same mind, to be in unity with each other, saying, have that same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, became a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, you always have to wonder why the therefore is therefore. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Do we see Jesus as prophet, priest, and king? Do we see Jesus as our all in all? Or are we looking for something else, someone else, some other head of government to ease our existential anxiety? And I think we have a litmus test coming to us very, very soon, in two weeks, for instance. How we as Christians respond to this election will be our witness. The world will be looking at us as American Christians and our testimony will speak volumes. See, if I speak ill of one side or the other, or if I speak of good of one side over against the other, I will betray an anxiety that shows that my trust is ungrounded in Jesus Christ as King. See, regardless of how our government continues, will we show that we are anxious and obnoxious to the other side? Or will we show that our expectations of salvation and hope are in Jesus Christ? In other words, are we going to be united after all of this is said and done? Will we be at peace with one another, really united as Christians, not just the smile and the handshake and the tolerating of someone else's rhetoric? Or will we really hold hands together in peace? Will we be able to join together in those words of Howard Thurman, if I knew you and you knew me, and each of us could clearly see by that inner light divine the meaning of your heart and mine? I'm sure that we would differ less. We'd clasp our hands in friendliness. If you knew me and I knew you, Will we be able to join together? Will we trust together that Jesus is the Messiah who teaches us how to restore relationships with peace instead of violence? May we leave with these words in our mind, in our heart. 
in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Amen.